So the first objective is to define our values. And as, as I explained, the, our values are the guidepost, they're the general direction in which we want to move our lives that, that, are, that is going to provide meaning and context to the actions that we take. Um, but they're not goals or, or action plans themselves. There are two exercises that are really, really useful in do it in the um, build up to clearly defining our values and focusing in on what is most important to us right here, right now in our current lives that is going to guide us and move us forward. The first one is to um, think about your funeral. And this is, a, this is sometimes a hard one because the thought of dying and leaving this world can be a very difficult, that can bring up some very difficult emotions. Um, but this also gives us an opportunity to really think about what that means for us. What, what does, when we think about death, when we think about our funeral, when that evokes a, an emotional response of sadness or fear, that is a good time where we can employ some of the other strategies and skills that we've learned and been practicing over the past few weeks, such as diffusion or presence, really coming into the moment and feeling what that feels like listening to the thoughts that come up when we, when we think about our own mortality. Back in 2016, this became very real for me personally when I was um, dealing with my family issues related to my grandma who was 90 and had you know recently lost her husband, my grandpa, and had to sell her house and move out, was starting to lose her memory and had to move into a retirement community and was you know, moving into a stage in her life when she was more dependent on others than she had been her whole life. She'd been a very you know, strong, courageous, independent woman. And that experience brought me more in contact with my own fears around aging, you know, the aging process and your body breaking down and becoming more dependent on others. And based on the way that my family responded to my grandma's aging and memory loss, that made me very fearful for myself, thinking about my future self being, you know, 90 years old and not being able to count on or trust that the people in my life would be able to step up and step in and help me in my time of need. And so that, you know, that experience really um, triggered this uh, idea in me that I, that I need to really think about my own life and my own actions and how, how I'm living. And if my, if my thoughts, words, and actions were actually in alignment with my values, or if what I was seeing happening, you know, with other people, if that was, you know, if that was what I was actually doing. And so, um, so when it came to doing this exercise, that was the memory that came up for me that I needed to reflect upon was this idea of my grandparents um, coming closer to death and how they, you know, how they had lived their lives, what I thought about them and what other people would say about them. 
And so there are two parts to this exercise. The first part is to think about and write about what you fear people will say. So if right now you continue engaging in patterns of behavior which are um, mindless and not centered, not open, not engaged, what do you fear that people will say at your funeral about you? And then the second part is to um, think about and write about what you hope people will say. So if you commit to change and action and living a value-based life, what do you hope that that will lead to? And this is a good exercise to provide that context and provide that clarity around what really matters to you as an individual. So for myself, <clears throat> what I really fear and have feared for a long time is that I will be seen as somebody who said I was one thing, but didn't actually act in accordance with what I said, you know, who I said I was. Um, you know, I fear that people in my life will, you know, come to my funeral or not come to my funeral and, you know, say things like, you know, they think I, you know, if they think I had an impact, they think I did important work. They didn't really know because they didn't really know me because I wasn't a part of anybody's life. I was so um, consumed with my work and my own self that I didn't take action. I didn't um, involve myself in my family deeply. I didn't um, involve myself in my friendships deeply. I avoided social interactions and so didn't share myself with the world. Therefore, nobody really knows me, you know. And that's really, that's, that is something that scares me because I, I want to be a person that, um, you know, that is seen differently because I see myself differently. Um, but when I really thought about how I am, how I am perceived and the, the actual things that I'm doing, not the things that I say that I'm doing or the things that I say that I care about, but the actual things, you know, observable, measurable actions that I was taking really led me to this, um, to, to this conclusion that, you know, really made my fear a reality was that I wasn't acting in accordance with those values. I didn't go out and do this, do the things that I want, said I wanted to do. And so my fear is that people would say that they don't really know me and that, you know, I, I, um, you know, was really, I was busy all the time, but never really got anything done. And, you know, I said I wanted to do all sorts of things, but never, never actually got around to doing them because I was too busy. And people didn't really know me because I didn't put any effort into building and maintaining relationships. But then I want, then I turn to what I hope people say and why, and this really brings up why this work to me is so important. Um, and as behavioral scientist, you know, I, I fo have focused so much of my career and my life on you know, putting my needs second and focusing all of my attention and my energy on um, helping other people. And, um, but that caused in me a lot of strife because I was only, I was only focused on others and their needs and not my own. Therefore, I, you know, expended all of my resources, all of my energy, all of my time and energy and resources were put on, you know, in other places. And therefore I found myself in a place where it was that I was very empty and hollow and lonely um, and depressed and sad and all sorts of, you know, other um, negative adjectives that you want to put on it. So when I thought about this and 
uh, really starting to delve into what I really, what I hope people say about me. It's that I, that I lived a valued life, that I was honest and I was open and I was caring and compassionate and cared deeply about helping others find peace, love, and joy in their lives. And I want to all, I want also people to, um, to say and understand how deeply my faith is in the power of behavioral science, the systematic application of behavioral science to address the um, you know, pervasive and systemic problems that our world has and, and continues to suffer from, people in the world continue to suffer from. I want people to say at my funeral that I have, you know, I, the work that I have done, the life that I've lived, and the things that I've done in my life have had meaning not only to um, not only to my clients and to myself and to my family, but to my community. And that I have, you know, the work that I've done has left an impact and left a legacy on which can on which others can build. I want people to say that I have broad shoulders, which isn't, you know, that's not one of those things that you would typically, um, you know, culturally want to have said about you. But I want to have broad shoulders because that means to me that I was, um, you know, had a significant impact and I was strong and I was courageous and I used my story to help others and to shape the lives of others. And I've left room for those who will come after me. Um, you know, I want to be one of those giants on which people can stand on the shoulders of, just like I stand on the shoulders of the giants in our field who have come before me. So that's what I hope people say. We'll see if that comes true. I won't see, but somebody will see. Um, so, I, I really look forward to um, uh, seeing how other people respond to this because for me it was a really, you know, really deep thing to think about and um, something that was, um, you know, it brought up a lot of emotions and it really caused me to pause and consider what I really want to be about and who I really want to be. So the other exercise within um, this area that helps us more clearly define what our um, values are is to first consider each of the value domains and how they relate to our lives um, and begin to think about and write about what are all of those things that hold meaning for us? And what are the things that we value within each of these domains? And so I have the 12 domains listed out here. And the first one is marriage or intimate partnership or intimate relationships. For me, it's, mar for me, it's marriage. Um, and in this area, I really value open, honest communication, calmness, uh, collaboration, uh, constantly striving to improve upon um, yourself and constantly supporting the other um, individual in your, in your life or in my life um, to improve and, and vice versa. This has been, so I, this year I'm going on uh, 13 years of marriage and I, I feel that we have a very unique relationship and, but it's one that I really enjoy sharing with others because um, while, you know, we're not always 
completely open or completely honest or we're not always completely calm. Um, what we do have is an ability to keep things in perspective and use um, you know, a good dose of humor and laughter to make it through some challenge, you know, make it through challenging times and keep moving forward uh, because we care so deeply about each other. One of the coolest and the funniest things that I, um, that we have done within our relationship, kind of, especially as we have both started to um, go through the process of identifying our own values and um, being more aware of you know when we're absent from the present moment and how to come in more in contact with the present moment. Um, one of the coolest experiences that I had with uh, my husband was moving up to Alaska and being able to um, learn how to be more present in the moment um, and then also understand and appreciate the challenges that we were being faced with and how we could help each other um, cope with those changes, cope with the challenges and, and help each other move forward and move through them. And so um, we actually kind of came up with this really funny way to kind of help each other through the challenging times and really gamify our gamify our lives um, because we were being asked to do things and being kind of pushed to do things that were completely out of our comfort zone. And so had it not been for that and our ability just to, you know, roll with the punches and make, you know, make jokes and laugh and sing and dance and, um, you know, bring joy and bring bliss into moments which otherwise were, you know, very lacking in the bliss, um, in, in uh, the bliss factor. Um, it really helped, you know, really helped me and him move through and persevere in the face of adversity. And so, you know, those are the things which I value most with, which in, within my marriage and within that intimate relationship because it keeps me going, not only you know, within the relationship itself, but just within my own life, having that partner who, can, um, who I can laugh with and uh, you know, get feedback from and get, give feedback to in a kind, caring, and compassionate way that helps us both grow and both um, continue to um, develop as individuals and as a couple. <clears throat> when it comes to parenting, um, so I am not yet a parent, but I have worked with a lot of parents. Um, I have, you know, been involved in the lives of a lot of parents and families. Um, and I, you know, I hope one day to um, have a family of my own and be a parent myself. And so within this domain of, you know, within this value area, the things that I value the most in regard to parenting are clear and consistent expectations, accountability, kindness and compassion, um, you know, doing things to um, make your child's life better, but not, you know, not, but not by removing all forms of pain and suffering, but using those moments as teachable moments to help develop skills in children. And this is, you know, these are the, these are the values that I bring into the work that I do. So I work with a lot of families, I work with a lot of children. And so being able, you know, myself being able to model these things for others and to be able to um, <clears throat> implement, you know, implement interventions um, that parents can then model after and follow is really important to me. Um, in regard to family, um, one of the one of the saddest things to me is that 
um, my family at this point is very um, small and disjointed. Um, and, but, you know, I have a hit, like I have, I, I value my family, um, but my mom passed away when I was 22. And so, you know, I don't have a mom. Um, my father is extremely abusive and is, you know, has issues with alcohol abuse. And so I don't have him in my life. Um, my brother is focused on his career and his family and is not a very, um, you know, kind, caring or compassionate person. So I don't really have him in my life. The two people that I have connected with the most and kept the most in contact with were my grandmas. Both of my grandpas have passed away. Um, but, um, and now one of my grandmas, but those were, you know, those were the people that I kept most in contact with. Um, but since my, um, my eldest grandma passed away at a hundred years old, um, and then my second grandma <clears throat> is experiencing dementia, it makes it difficult to connect with, you know, to connect with those family members. And so over the past couple years, I've really struggled because while I, you know, I have a wonderful partner who I can confide in and, you know, is my family, um, there hasn't really been anyone else in my family that I have been able to reach out to and to <clears throat> count on um, to, you know, just be there when I need to talk or if, you know, or anything like that. And so it's actually been recently in the past couple months um, and that I have developed a relationship with one of my uncles who is actually my mom's brother and her only you know, her only uh, surviving sibling at this point. Um, and it was actually through the work of Afapwa that he came to understand who I was as a person. And we've been able to develop a, you know, develop a different type of relationship where, and, you know, to a point where this week when I was struggling the most and, you know, began having a, you know, essentially a panic attack where I, you know, I just needed I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to turn to. You know, I, my husband is wonderful, but you know, we were having, not we were having problems, but we were, you know, we we're having an issue in our lives that, you know, he and I um, have, you know, exhausted all of our potential solutions to our, to the problem that we're, that we're facing. And so, you know, I needed somebody else. I had this emotional reaction, which when I got really, Kind of present in the moment and started to feel what that really felt like and with the you know the heart racing and the adrenaline pumping and the crying and the um you know hyperventilating it was you know almost an, an automatic response that came to me that said you know call your uncle right now you need to talk you need to talk to somebody and he's the only person in your life that has demonstrated um, that they really get you and understand what you're going through. And it was, you know, it was such a wonderful experience for me because in previously in those times in my life, when I didn't feel like I had anyone who I could turn to, I would, you know, go inside, um, cry to myself and then stuff the feelings away and then pretend like nothing was, nothing was wrong. And this was really the first time in my life where I was able to, you know, use that lifeline and make that call and have that conversation and let it all out. The cries and the cursing and the, you know, the big emotional, like, tell me how you really feel about the situation. Um, and it was so extremely cathartic for me because um, you know, because I was actually able to fully express myself to somebody who I, who I was confident um, would really get it. 
and not necessarily, you know, I wasn't looking for solutions. I just needed somebody to listen so I could, you know, say the words that needed to be said without stuffing them away, without pretending like it didn't exist. And through that conversation, I was able to, for myself, you know, de develop a plan um, where before that happened, I was feeling rather, you know, directionless or hopeless or without a plan. And that was really, um, you know, evoked some negative reaction, negative emotional response. In me. So with my family, I really value having somebody within my family outside of my marriage that I can count on, that I can call, that I can contact, that I can um, trust will be there for me and um, be able to help provide some perspective. When it comes to my friends and my social life, this is an area where I have consistently struggled and where you know I've always wanted to have friends. I, I could list off a number of friends in my life. Um, but again, kind of going back to the funeral, you know, what I fear that people would say is, you know, I would in, invite all or all of these friends would be invited to my funeral. And they wouldn't have anything to say because they don't really know me. I don't really, I don't keep in contact. I don't call, I don't really text. You know, we barely, barely keep in touch on Facebook. And so, you know, most of my relationships throughout my life have been very shallow and very superficial. Um, and this had a lot to do with the fact that my family moved around a lot when I was, when I was a child. And so, you know, I'd have you know a few years where I develop relationship and then we would move, um, and then you know my my child brain like I wanted those people to you know call me and uh, write letters and all of those things, but um, none of that happened and and none of my efforts were reciprocated, and so that was really hard for me where I you know I got to the point where I just kind of shut down. Um, the idea of even having friends uh, because none of my attempts were ever reciprocated. Therefore, you know, I felt as though I, you know, my, I had no value in my quote unquote friends lives or eyes. And so it wasn't worth pursuing, but I do, I do value and I do want friendships and social relationships and a social life that is deep and meaningful and reciprocated and caring and you know um something that i you know something that i can count on people who can um, who i can share myself with and who can share their self selves with me and um and because there's so much there's so much life to be lived and to you know be lonely and not have people who care about you and that you care about um it's really hard and it, and it can get very um, lonely feeling. Um, in regards to my work and my career, the things that I value most are leaving an impact and positively impacting people's lives and um, showing through my daily actions, the power of behavioral science um, and how it can positively impact this world. Um, in regard to my education and training, the things that bring that are most valuable to me right now are related to the to the things that are going to serve me in the future, um, in uh, specifically with regard to action for a peaceful world and for our the Alaskan Oasis Wellness Retreat. Um, so all of the you know my values regarding education and training are in alignment with gaining more knowledge and expertise and expanding my scope of competence in regard to the things that I want to do in the future. And so that, you know, those are my values that I am, that I'm following in regard to those. Um, in, in, in relation to recreation and fun, I grew up in Alaska. I've lived 
almost constantly in my life, I've lived in places where I have full access to things that I would list out on my list, you know, my, when somebody were to ask me my hobbies or I was writing them down, you know, I would tell you that I love um, camping and hiking and fishing and mountain biking and, and kayaking and rock climbing and all of these things, you know, I could list out, oh, and snowboarding and, you know, all of these outdoor adventures and outdoor activities are of value to me. I love being outside. I love being in nature, um, you know, exploring nature. But these aren't things, this isn't something that I have um, consistently lived in accordance with most of the time because I was too busy and I made lots of excuses why I couldn't do those things. But those things are of high importance to me and high value is, you know, getting back to nature and being, um, being outside and being in the fresh air and being in the out of doors and being physically active um, are really, really valuable to me. In the area of spirituality, this is, this is an area that I have, again, struggled with my whole life. And um, as many people have had, um, I had some pretty uh, traumatic and confusing experiences around organized religion as I was growing up. And therefore, I... Um, you know, I pushed anything, anything that had to do with um, spirituality and getting in touch with myself and really understanding who I am and, you know, my place in this world were things that I actively avoided and, you know, like act as, acted as if they didn't even exist. Um, but more recently, I have begun to um, and it's really been through the work of acceptance and commitment therapy and really gaining skills in relation to coming into the present moment, under, um, you know, getting in touch with my, um, my thoughts and my feelings and my emotions and the physiological responses and my um, kind of default mode of active avoid, experiential avoidance. Um, I've actually, you know, I found a value in coming, becoming more aware of the interconnectedness between us all as not only humans, but just inhabitants of this world in general. And so kind of being able to, you know, be fully present and experience this world from a centered and open place has kind of created and instilled in me this deeper sense of connection with myself and, and with other humans, which to me um, feels more authentic uh, as, I, as I'm able to talk about my experiences as opposed to anything that I have learned or experienced throughout my life in regard to organized religion. When it comes to my uh, citizenship and um, community life, this isn't something, this is actually something that I wasn't very aware that I cared a lot about because I was so focused on myself and my career and just the, you know, the microcosm, which was my professional life. Um, my understanding of my own community and my role in it and what I could do to positively impact things was very limited. And it wasn't until I came to Alaska and lived in a smaller community and was, you know, essentially forced to put myself out there and be a part of a um, community where I was then able to see the interconnection between us all and the similarities between us all and the struggle, you know, similar struggles and strife that we all face. Um, 
and kind of my place and my role within that environment, uh, which which came, uh, which helped me really clarify for myself what really mattered and how I could utilize my story and my experiences to have a positive impact on um, on my community in in more in specific. Um, in relation to my physical self and well-being, uh, my the things that I value the most are um, physical wellness, again, and nutritional wellness. So again, these are things that, as I've watched people age, I've seen two paths. I've seen the you know don't take care of my body, don't take care of my mind. Um, path and where that leads. And so, you know, I have someone very significant in my life who, you know, due to, you know, my theory, my guess is that due to all of the um, stress and alcohol abuse and domestic violence um, that, and, uh, you know, stuffing down of emotions that this significant person in my life has experienced, you know, has a um, you know, she's arthritic from head to toe and is crunched over and her hands are, you know, her hands are gnarled and she's really stiff and rigid. Um, and then I haven't, you know, I have another example in my life of, you know, being my grandma that lived to be a hundred years old and she was like open and free and took care of her body and spent a lot of time outside and ate you know, ate well, but wasn't, you know, wasn't overly critical about things. She just, you know, ate things that were good and whole and that she enjoyed. And then, you know, every once in a while she would treat herself. Um, and so this has, being able to see the experiences of others and kind of their life trajectory and where that has you know, led them in their later years has really instilled in me this value for physical self-care and mental health care, uh, yeah, mental care, um, to make sure that I'm, you know, doing yoga on a regular basis and that I am meditating and that I'm eating well and, you know, not over consuming um, food or alcohol or things like that, which are going to negative, that which might not have a negative impact on the short term, but they will have a cumulative negative effect. Um, and so because I have learned the value of these things, those are, those are things that are important to me and drive my life. Um, in regard to the environment and environmental issues, the things that I care about the most are the ocean and the forest. Um, I live on an island in Southeast Alaska, which is surrounded by ocean and is covered in trees. And so these things, these issues are really important to me. Um, and they're ones that I, you know, try to pay attention to and um, take action on when I can and be involved. Um, but it's some, you know, something that is not at this point in my life isn't really high priority on my list of things that I'm actively engaging in, but it's something kind of in, um, in my life that I hope to one day be able to take more effective action in relate in regard to. Um, and lastly, in the domain of art and creative expression, this is one of the areas that I have historically, again, similarly to recreation and fun, I would historically describe myself as um, a piano player and a dancer and a writer and a photographer. And um, based on that description, you would think that I was, you know, uh, really good at all of these things and did all, you know, um, you know, put a lot of effort into doing those things on a regular basis. But the reality is if you actually looked at my, you know, actions on a day-to-day -day basis, I very rarely engaged in behaviors related to this value. Um, and a lot of it had to do with my own inhibition, my own suppression of those urges to let myself go and 
uh, do those things, even though they, you know, when I did them, they bring me a lot of joy. I used, you know, my work and my career and my busyness and my, you know, need for um, uh, money as an excuse not to engage in those things that actually you know, fulfilled my soul and my self as a, as a human being, um, which has had in itself some detrimental impacts. 